Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ingar. I work as a um, consultant in Norway. I um, usually, on, when I'm out at the client's place, I'm usually employing the role of like a front-end tech lead or something, some fancy title. But I think the important part is that I feel it's like my responsibility to make sure that me and my team members are able to deliver value for my clients and ultimately the end users. That's not that a radical thought, right? And we usually make um, web applications and making web applications is hard and I think a lot about how we can simplify that process. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. I think a lot about how we can better our developer experience of developing web applications. And I'm going to talk about like choosing the tools that work for you. That's the emphasis on the for here. Um, and by tool here, I mean like what you use to create the application. So that will be a language, programming language, would be like the framework you're developing in, and like the CLI and the compiler or transpiler or the whole package. That's what I mean by tool here. Um, a lot of these perspectives come from spending a lot of time writing pretty large um, JavaScript applications, TypeScript applications, with mostly React and Redux. And I think it's pretty hard to make a great web, ap <coughs> web application. It's not trivial. And the hardest part of developing, writing code, I think that's me. My tools, they don't lack in discipline. The compiler will output the same bytecode or whatever every single time, or the linter will give you the same error for the same input every time. But me, I won't do the same thing like all the time, presented with the same problem. That might depend on external factors like did I have my first coffee in the morning? Or am I really full after a great pizza lunch? I might decide differently of how to handle some, some case. And, but tools don't do that. They, they do the same thing each time. And like, Error handling, for example. Do you always remember to write that try catch block? Or do you figure like it probably won't throw an error, so I'll just skip it? You might, and it might work fine, or you might not, and I don't know, something might happen. It might not. But point being, you decide differently each time you're presented, maybe with the same problem, depending on some external state yourself. And I was thinking, like, why doesn't our tools like guide us more in the right direction? If some function can't throw an error, why aren't I forced to um, handle that case of the function throwing the error. Because um, tools can help alleviate the human aspect of developing. Um, and a lot of like, tools, languages, and frameworks, they suffer from, in my opinion, from having too many options. I have to decide all the time, like all these small decisions to 
Do I write the try catch block? Do I um, do the null check? Do I do the length check of the array before accessing the first element and so on? These small decisions. And as I said, I might do it differently at different times in the day. And there's, if there was like one way that was arguably better to do something, why shouldn't our tools force us to do it that way? Um, I am, as I said, I spent a lot of time writing like React Redux applications. And, and I've done uh, several workshops and taught people how to use this. And a lot of time people ask whether to store state locally in the React components or if you should pull it up and put it in the Redux store, right? Um, it's the, the local, local state in React components. It's easier to put it there. It takes less code to put it there. But it hides, hides things and it might have um, unintended side effects like inconsistent UI because of the state is not reproducible anymore. So that's one of the good part about Redux is it puts all your state in one place and with that you can always reproduce the same UI. And another problem with um, reactive Redux is um, where to do, where or how to do AJAX calls. Like we're writing a web application, we're probably fetching some data from the server and you can do it in line in the React components or you can use some library like Redux Thunk or Redux Actions or Redux Saga. It doesn't matter if you don't know all these libraries or buzzwords, but point being, you have to take so many decisions of how to do it and when to do it. You gotta decide each time. But there are always, almost always, one way that's recommended more than the other ways, right? That's usually it. And so I'm thinking, why do I have to have all these options? I just want to do this thing and be done with it. Um, I uh, googled how to create a range of number, an array with a range of numbers in JavaScript. And I found this. So that was pretty interesting. All of these do the exact same thing. Is any of these better than the other? I don't know. There might be some performance issues with using dot keys, for example, or using the spread here, or doing the fill. I don't know. They all do the same thing. And you might think, okay, one of them might look nicer. You might prefer this one, or you might prefer this one, or whatever, but which one to use? Well, of course, if you use like a utility library like Lodash or underscore, you can just do underscore dot range, but this is like with that, no external dependencies. These are some of the ways of creating a range of numbers in JavaScript. Some might have implications of performance or something else, but I don't know. You gotta remember or you maybe have to decide in your team which one you prefer, and so on. And that brings me to the Elm part. This is, this is the quote on the Elm webpage, and I think it 
pretty much sums up this talk um, because it says there it's delightful language for reliable web apps. I want to make reliable web apps to make the users of the web app happy. I want to make my clients happy. That's what I want to do. And I want to have a delightful experience doing it. Sounds nice so far. So um, I got interested in Elm because of the uh, technical aspects. Elm has, is a uh, pure functional language with static types. It's cool. It also promises no, <coughs> no runtime errors. It's pretty nice, pretty bold statement. That got me interested. I wanted to see, is it, is it really true? And how is it to use? Because if we did all these decisions on what tools to use based on only the technical aspects, we'd probably be using something like uh, some dependently typed language like Idris or Cock or something, because they have all the technical aspects right. But they're hard to use. And they might not have all the tooling. So it also, a tool you use has to appeal to you and it has to help you do your job. And um, that's what we're going to talk about more now. So, creating a range of numbers. By Elm 16, it had these two ways of doing it. You might prefer this one, it's like a list comprehension thing, or you might prefer this one. It's not that important, but you probably would have to decide in your team which one should we use, should we use this or the other. They do the same thing. One might have performance implications, I don't know. As of Elm 18, which is the newest one now, we have this. The developers of Elm decided that why have two ways of achieving the exact same goal when we can have one way? It's simpler, right? So this um, the list range is a function, which this thing is not. This is syntax. This is a function, and if you saw Scott Blushin's talk earlier today, you know that functional programming is about the power of composition, and functions can be composed. So this one is actually better, which is nice. But the point is, when a newcomer to Elm comes, or a new person on your team asks you, how do I create a range of numbers in Elm? You say, list of range. That's the only way to do it. You don't use that so much, though, but. And this is this philosophy here of removing similar things that do the same, where one of the other is not necessarily arguably better, is a, is a kind of a philosophy in the Elm community. So if you want to do HTTP, like want to do AJAX stuff in Elm, you use Elm HTTP. It's one choice. If you want to do HTML stuff, which you probably will if you're making a web application, you use Elm HTML. If you want to do testing in Elm, you use Elm test. And it makes it so much easier for a um, new person, newcomer to the language or the community to figure out what to do. And it, it, the community um, gathers around like these ideas and share efforts to make them better instead of having a fragmented sea of choices, which you might think is bad if you 
really enjoy JavaScript and having 10,000 options for everything you want to do. Some people enjoy that, and I get it, get it. But my goal at my job is to make great user experiences. Great user experiences, <coughs> they make, every, make users happy, they make clients happy, and they make money. Great user experiences make money. And th that, that's what I want. And I want a tool to help me do that. And I, um, I borrowed this from uh, Kelvin Henney's talk uh, a couple of hours ago. Um, just had to include it in my slides. He was going to talk about like, errors and how to handle stuff, how to present data to the user in a sensible way. So the quote is from John Carmack, and it says, a large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states their code may execute in. Because we might have to try to keep all of the application state in our head at one time, and that's hard. And you might have seen something like this. Some generic error message thingy. The cool part is, it says here, this should never happen. Some, some error that shouldn't happen that obviously did, right? So if a code path is possible, it's theoretically possible, it will probably happen at some point, right? Experience tells us that. So we got to, we should really like account for all these, all the possibilities, all the code paths, ideally. And to, uh, this is to avoid unexpected behavior and to provide a user with correct information at the right time. And this takes discipline and or a lot of tests. And as I posited earlier, tools don't like in discipline, but people do. So we're going to explore this for a bit. We're going to talk about remote data. Super generic term. It's data that's fetched from somewhere else. Like in a web application, it's probably an AJAX request fetching some data from your, your backend server. And it's, this data is not immediately available in your application. You have to start up your application and then fetch it. So you have some state changes. We're gonna fetch a list of users. We hopefully have users in our, in our app. So, <clears throat> uh, this is a type in Elm. Model is like the convention for the type um, that signifies the state of our application. <clears throat> and initial model here is a value of that type. Does this look right? This is data that fetched from some remote location. So what does this signify, that the list is empty? Does it mean that we have zero users? Does it mean that we have not fetched, not started fetching? Does it mean that we may be loading or that we had an error? Doesn't say that much, does it? Okay, so um, our designer tells us we have to show this nice animation while we're fetching the data because it takes 
three seconds because it goes to a remote mainframe written in COBOL or something. So I have to show a nice animation so the users don't, don't exit. So we add a flag. It's loading, which is a Boolean. Starts out as false. This is like when the application starts up. Starts out as false. Bef this is before we even started fetching the users. And you're sitting there developing and the request times out. So we need some way to handle errors or some way to show the user that I'm sorry it took too long. So we add another field, an error, which is maybe an HTTP error. Maybe here um, is something that is either nothing or it's something. Either there, there is no error or there is an error, and if there is an error, it's an HTTP error. So it starts out as nothing. Before we, we've started the request, we have no errors. So we're going to now try to write the view code for this, for presenting the user with either uh, text that says loading or a text that uh, says there was an error or that we have users. And we might do, do it like one of these. The difference between these two is just the order of how we, how we check things. The case here is something in Elm called pattern matching, and it's what we do when we have stuff like a maybe. So, first one, say that, okay, if it's loading, then we print loading. Then, if we have an error, we print we have an error, and if not, we have users. And this is pretty much the same, just that we check error first. Because these two fields are the error and the loading, they're not related, well, they're semi-related because we know that they're related, but there's nothing that our tool can help us with to figure out that they belong together, that they should be checked together. So all this comes down to the developer having to decide which order should I check things? And also, I have to remember to check things. Because there's nothing here stopping me from skipping checking the error and just showing either we're loading or we have users. And still, we don't handle the case of before we've started loading the data. When the application boots up, it might do something else before fetching users, before starting, and we don't handle that case. It's a possibility. So we're going to rethink this problem. And so the actual real world states we go through is when our application starts, users, we haven't asked for them yet. Then we ask for them, and it transitions to the loading state. And when the loading is done, we'll either, either get to the error state or the success state. And from there, we can go back to loading, of course. So, in Elm, we can model this in a way that makes sense, at least to me. We can do this. This is called a call the union type. 
So we can read it as user data is either not asked or loading or it's a success. And if it's a success, we have a list of users. And if it's an error, we have it's an HTTP error. And this corresponds more to the real world model of the problem because it can't be in two of these states at the same time. So we can trim down our model to this. We say that users is of this type we created earlier. And the initial state is not asked. And if we want to write the view code for it, it looks like this. So I mentioned earlier it's called pattern matching. So if it's not asked, we do this. It's loading to this, success, this, error, this. And pattern matching in Elm is pretty cool because it helps us. If I forgot to add the error branch, I would get this. This is the compiler telling me, hey, you haven't handled the error case. You should probably do it. And it points me to a link to where I can read more about how to handle this. But the point is, it will tell me you haven't handled one of the code paths. You have to do it, or else you'll get unintended something. So this is actually a library by a guy called Chris Jenkins. It is called Remote Data um, that encapsulates this idea of how to handle remote data. Um, so if you're ever doing some HTTP in Elm, you should really use it. It's really good. And this is a third party package. It lives in the package elmlang.org. It's Elm's NPM equivalent. It has its own package repository. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the frustrations I've had earlier. It's I'm on a team with 15 developers writing front-end code. We have way too many third-party dependencies. This is a TypeScript application. Probably way too many dependencies because we have like all these things that we need, but one of the most nerve-wrecking parts of working in that team was doing a deploy to production after upgrading packages. Upgrading third-party dependencies. In the, um, when using JavaScript and PM and this stuff, you kind of rely on the package authors adhering to semantic versioning. Semantic versioning is great but it takes discipline from the person writing the code and publishing the package. And if everything goes well, a major version does have an API uh, breaking change. If all goes well, um, a patch release will work the same as before and a minor release will add some new functionality. But there's nothing stopping anyone from accidentally breaking the public API and only increasing, like only bumping the patch version. You probably want a lot of tests to ensure that it works okay, but you have to, yeah, the tools don't really help you. You have to do it yourself. You have to be disciplined. So, 
one of the cool things that Elm does is the package manager will help you with this. Because Elm is statically typed, so we can analyze a lot more about the code. So if I change the signature of one of my public facing functions from taking an int to taking a string, for example, the Elm package manager will tell me that, hey, you're not able to publish this to the package repository without incrementing the major version because you've actually broken the API. And that's, I think that's pretty cool because now I know that tools are helping me and other package authors, they're helping adhering, like helping us um, not break, accidentally breaking other people's code. I think that's very nice. It makes me sleep better at night after upgrading X number of packages. And it also enforces writing documentation for all public facing values. So on the uh, uh, package .org website, all libraries are documented. All public functions and values and types, they have documentation. So Elm will force you to write this if it's a public facing value. Which I th that's a pretty nice one, trying to learn a new library, figuring, it, figuring, figuring out how it works, because there is documentation for it. And we can actually use that ourselves, which we'll see now. So I think we pretty much all of us agree that documentation in some form is good. It's boring to write, but it's useful to have. And that was, of course, that would be uh, documentation that's not outdated and lives in some weird confluence space that should have been deleted 10 years ago. But so about like documentation for your code. And well, like we were making web applications. And documentation for a web application doesn't only have to be like the comments on some function. We're making web applications. There is some graphical element to it. You probably have some button and some list function that you can, you, you might remember how it looks, you might not, after coming back from winter holidays or something. So we can, what if we could document how they look without you having to dig through your whole application and seeing, okay, where, where did my fellow developer use this primary button? What did it look like and everything? It's nice for, if, if we can have some place to view it. This is similar to if you're in the React space, like React Style Guide list or React Storybook or stuff like that. So, I told you that the Elm Package Manager will enforce writing documentation for public facing values. <coughs> Sorry. And we can use that. You see the help um, for the Elm make, which is the Elm compiler. <coughs> you see that it takes a flag, can take a flag docs, which writes documentation to a file as a JSON. JSON is nice. We know how to use that. We use that all the time in our applications. So let's see how we can use that. Um, this is 
my uh, simple little module. It's a view module uh, that has two values. It's a primary button and it's a secondary button. And we're gonna see what we can do with this. <coughs> we, if we add it to the exposed modules of Elm package JSON, this is the same as uh, third party like library authors use. You can expose only some modules and keep the other others hidden so you can hide your implementation details. So we can add the modules we want to be documented to this array. And if we now try to run I'll make with the docs, it says documentation error in view.alm. Something, something, and learn more at some URL. If you go to that URL, it will tell us that, okay, if you have some exposed modules, you will have to document them. And this is the format you're documenting, and this is what you probably should write, and it gives a lot of guidance on how to write good uh, documentation comments. So, skip ahead, we've read that, and we've ended up with this module. Same module with comments. So, this is a module level documentation that says, this is a module containing common views. And this is a primary button is the most important button on the page, which is cool. Button primary, this is an example of how you call it, text a string, and that's the text in the button. It also says the secondary button is not the most important button on the page. It's probably not that helpful, but we want to visualize it anyway, right? So this will give us a JSON output like this. It's an array on the top level because you have, you expose X number of modules. So we only have one module, so we have one element in the array. This is the name of the module. This is the comment, the top level comment in the module. And aliases and types, we can skip that for now. And we have values. Our functions are values. So it says name and the comment for that value and the type. Sounds cool. We can now serve this file from our backend. We have a server, we can serve it. And in our Elm code, we just create some types for these things. A module has a name and a comment and a list of values. And a value has a name, a comment, and a type. <coughs> Reason I need the underscore in the type there is because type is a reserved keyword. So with this, we can write some more code. This is the code for viewing the documentation. And <coughs> what we did at my, um, my project now, we actually added this to our application. It's on some hidden URL that users don't know about, but we developers, our designers, we all know this URL and we use it so, because we're spending most of our days, like looking at our editors and the application we're developing. So if the documentation is in the application, it's pretty readily available, right? It will have the same CSS as the other parts of the application. So previews of these um, values will look the same. We haven't gotten to previews yet, because now it looks like this. Some documentation for my app and module view, the name of the module and the comment, and we see the values. Looks kind of boring, right? 
So we want to make like a UI component gallery. I, when I say UI component, I mean this, like, these buttons are UI components. Uh, some list view might be a UI component or some icon. Um, and we can use this to look up what already exists in the application. You can use this when I see it a designer sketch. I can see, use this uh, gallery to see, oh, we already have this implemented, so it should be quick to add it, or vice versa. So, and we can use it to develop our views in isolation. It's really annoying having to, to um, make some new fancy list view thing three levels deep in our application. <coughs> and each time I make a change, I have to do like three network requests to see the change I made, right? So it's easier to mock some data and see the actual view immediately. And we can do this inside this gallery because it's made from our own code. So a value in Elm is identified by the module name, which in our case was view, and the value name, which was either button primary or button secondary. So if you if write a function like this, it's called preview and it takes a string which will be the module name and the value name. <coughs> Sorry. And we can pattern match on strings too. And if it's button primary, we can actually call the button primary function. And similarly for button secondary. And remember that Elm told us if we didn't handle all cases when we pattern matched, we have to have this underscore, which is a wildcard match. Because <clears throat> there's no possible way we can actually write out all possible values for a string. It's just not possible. So we just show a no preview found for this, if it happens. If we then add the preview call to some, some function that views our value, along with the preview, we can end up with something like this. So this makes much more sense than having just a comment and type. So now we can actually see how it looks. So when I look at a designer sketch, I know I can cross check that with this thing and see, oh, this is the primary button or this is the secondary button. And the code for this is available at my GitHub. So I'm going to start getting back to the more philosophical side of things. Because a good tool, in my opinion, it reduces the mental overhead of writing code. It, made it makes it easy for me to focus on the task at hand, what I want to make, instead of like technicalities like which order should I write these if checks in, or should I format this on like with the how to code style and everything, um, and like avoiding known pitfalls in the language like using, in JavaScript, using the double equals or the triple equals. Like, I don't want to think about those things. I want a tool that helps me just forget about those issues. Um, and speaking of, of formatting, Elm has Elm format, uh, which is great. Pretty much everybody uses it. it. It's similar to prettier in JavaScript, if you know that. It's a very opinionated tool that formats your code in one way. That's what it does. So you don't have to think about how to format your code. You don't have to spend time aligning brackets or signs or whatever. It saves time. It's blissful to use. 
So you, if you write Elm, use Elm format. If you write JavaScript, use Prettier. It's so nice. Um, and developer happiness for me is when the tools I use, they remove the friction between me and the code or between me and the screen. It takes away silly, to me, uninteresting um, decisions I have to take. And as I said, I want to make a great user experience because it makes everyone happy. Users are happy, bosses are happy, clients are happy, I am happy. And I really urge you to check out Elm and see if it's something for you. But not just because of the technical aspects, but for me, it's, it's the feeling I get when I sit there writing Elm code. I can actually focus on what I think is the interesting part, creating stuff instead of uh, worrying about remembering to use double equals or triple equals or having to remember to write that try catch block or whatever. So, um, actually I want to show you, we have some time still, so I want to show you uh, this, okay. So, here, this is the documentation thingy running right now. And it's, um, you can, um, you can, we can see how it looks with types and, um, and uh, uh, union types. So let's say we have um, some colors in our application for some reason, or say, let's say icons, which is like, a, let's say we have a finite set of icons. We have a edit icon, we have a download icon, something. So I add it to this view thing, and my editor will tell me this. Okay, icon doesn't have any documentation, so I have to add that. So um, the possible icons we have in this amazing application. And it pops up immediately and we can see, I don't actually have any icons though, I'm sorry. Um, but from this we can see the possible values and we can see that I got the immediate feedback on, that we're used to from saving in my editor and it just pops up in my app at the same time. And, um, and um, we can, uh, let's say we want to add a preview. Um, oh, cache key is not defined. Um, we can add a preview of this. So it's located in shared views and it was called icon. So let's see. Um, if we import the actual thing, we can do pattern match. Um, oh, we don't have a pattern match. We can um, just use it. <laughs> Uh, we can um, preview icon, and it was called edit, and we can preview icon and download, wasn't it? We add just a function here. So let's just do a span. Edit icon. 
So, see, again, error again, because I didn't handle all the branches. I need to handle the download. And and there we go. Uh, it doesn't actually show the uh, preview because I didn't add it to um, the types here. So let's just and so. View. And <laughs> preview missing. Okay. Uh, shared views. There we go. Looks silly. But that was the workflow of adding something new and adding the preview for it. Uh, the code is on GitHub and I, this can probably be done in, in several other languages and frameworks. And I encourage you to try to get into workflow. You know, previewing this thing, it's really nice. So, um, I have some, uh, some time left. So, are there any questions? Oh, you're getting a microphone. Oh, yeah. uh, so you talked about getting uh, packages and uh, management system and stuff. Uh, is there any support for creating <coughs> internal repositories or like private uh, package repositories? Um, not at the moment. Um, that's uh, an issue that's been raised a bunch of times, and there are <coughs> there are solutions. Uh, not official solutions, but our solution that people use. And it would probably be some official way of doing it at some time. But you can do it, but it's not in the official package, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. About the complexity of the UI that you can um, handle easily with Elm, uh, can you make? Uh, suppose you you are asked to to make it uh, an application of the complexity of Sketch, the desktop app. Oh yeah. Is possible to do this uh, with Elm in a oh yeah convenient yeah, yeah. way? Yeah, it's an, of course not some not an easy app to make, yeah. but. Yeah, well, you can you can do pretty much whatever you want, and um, yeah, <laughs> everything is okay. possible. Yeah, I, that I mean, it, it, mm, is there is a, an advantage with respect to using uh, React or uh, another framework? So uh, even for a very complex complex application, you would use Elm. Um, yeah, um, I think I would. It. Um, Depends on, like, if you do a lot of um, stuff that requires you to use the web platform APIs that are not yet supported in Elm, like mm -hmm. web audio might be inconvenient and, and um, web RTC, this stuff, that's inconvenient to do in Elm because Elm doesn't have official libraries for it yet, so you would have to call out to JavaScript and do it from there. In those kinds of applications, I would not use Elm, probably, if, most of the code is like web platform stuff. Um, but especially in applications where you have complex state, state management and everything, yeah. using union types and getting your compiler to tell you which states are actually possible, it's, it's very convenient and helps a lot. And okay, experience. thanks. This is the, the answer, yeah. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, in the back. How 
question was, how experienced was my team uh, when we started with Elm, correct? How, how experienced were they with functional programming yeah. before, before Elm? Uh, not that much. Uh, the team had experience with React and Redux, so they are functionally, functionally oriented libraries, so they had some experience from that, but did not have any experience in um, with type functional programming like Elm or F Sharp or something like that. And um, in my experience, if you want to teach someone functional programming, I think Elm is a pretty good fit because Elm focuses a lot on lowering the learning curve and uh, letting people, getting people quickly up to speed. The Mainly the target audience of Elm is JavaScript developers, and not all JavaScript developers uh, know functional programming, so, um, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>